Good morning and welcome to the 2021 AILA Annual Conference. I'm Emmy Smith, AILA's Director of Professional Development, and I'd like to formally welcome the participants who are joining us today. Please note that today's session is being recorded. If you would like to turn off the subtitles, press the live transcript button located on the bottom right of your screen and select hide subtitle, which will disable the live transcript. At this time, I'd like to turn the session over to AILA's Executive Director, Benjamin Johnson. Thank you very much, Emmy, uh, and welcome everybody to the second day of the 2021 AILA Annual Conference. Uh, I am Ben Johnson, and it is my daily honor and privilege to serve as your Executive Director, and it's my pleasure today to welcome you all to this year's event. Uh, you know, we often note that the annual conference is the largest gathering of immigration law practitioners in the country. And even in this virtual setting, that's still true. Uh, we have another really great turnout this year. We've got over 2,700 participants. We've got more than 90 sessions and trainings and 30 plus companies and organizations represented in our expo, expo hall that, that I hope you'll visit. You know, this event is only possible because of some really incredible work by some amazing staff and volunteer members. Uh, but it's also because of the support of uh, some really important sponsors, our diamond, platinum, and gold sponsors. Uh, so I want to thank Mod Squad, uh, Docketwise, Mitra Tech, LawPay, uh, and the ALA Malpractice Insurance Program for their ongoing support. Another great thing about uh, this year's event is that we have an exciting level of government participation that we haven't experienced in, I don't know, let's say maybe four years. <laughs> um, the Government Open Forum track begins this afternoon at 1 p.m. and it continues through tomorrow uh, with a full day of sessions. So, and including one uh, from the newly formed Detention Ombudsman's Office. So I hope you all have a chance to participate in those really valuable uh, open forum sessions to hear from the government directly. Uh, I hope you'll also join me later today for a conversation with uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, who is our keynote speaker uh, for this year's conference. Uh, I'm gonna be interviewing him based on questions that have been submitted by AILA members uh, and some other attendees. Uh, following that, the AILA Executive Committee will be giving you all the latest information in our Hot Topics panel, so I hope you can join for that. There's also going to be our annual membership meeting at 545 Eastern Time uh, tonight. Uh, we encourage all members to attend. We'll be giving updates about members' resources, new initiatives, as well as honoring recipients of annual awards and commendations and announcing, importantly, the election results for our new leadership team here at AILA. Uh, so log in early, you're gonna need to register in order to be part of that. Uh, so now we're going to hear from AILA's presidents. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to, uh, to do a short introduction uh, of Jennifer Manier, our current uh, 2020 to 2021 AILA president. She's got uh, another, few hours left in her presidency. I don't know if there'll be any last minute commutations or executive orders, but what I do know uh, is that Jennifer has been a truly incredible volunteer leader for many years. Uh, and her term as president, I think was a shining example of that kind of leadership that she has been bringing to AILA. Under truly impossible circumstances, she, she led and encouraged all of us to rise to the occasion. So Jennifer, Thank you for all that you have done for AILA, all that I know that you will continue to do. We are incredibly grateful for your service. And now I will turn the screen over to the amazing Jennifer Manier. Thank you, Ben. And welcome everyone to the annual conference. Uh, really wish I could see all of you in person, but I'm glad that so many of you are able to attend virtually. This AILA year has been full of highs and lows. It has presented challenges that have tested us and opportunities that have inspired us. And as we always do, the AILA community has risen to meet those challenges and opportunities head on. We began this AILA year last June with the presidential administration still in place that perhaps more than at any time in our history was dedicated to the systematic disruption and dismantling of US immigration law. During the final months of 2020, as then President Trump attempted to complete construction of the invisible wall that he had begun 
in 2016, we fought back harder than ever. Over the last 12 months, ALA drafted and submitted or joined coalition partners in submitting over 30 formal comments to regulatory policy and form changes. We organized 10 national regulatory campaigns, which generated more than 11,300 comments on various issues, including nearly 5,000 comments on the July 2020 asylum rule and 1,200 comments on the H-1B registration rule. As we continue to litigate high impact cases, including successful challenges to the immigrant visa ban, the Department of Labor's multiple attempts to change the prevailing wage levels, and USCIS's attempts to dramatically increase fees. More recently, we've sued over processing delays on EAD applications for L2 and H4 applicants, as well as the H1B lottery rule that would unlawfully exclude recent college graduates and other entry-level workers from the H1B system. In July 2020, your Director of Government Relations, Shev Dalal Dahaney, testified before Congress about the U.S. budget crisis. In September, Congress passed the Emergency Stopgap Stabilization Act that provided accountability measures for the agency, allowed for expanded premium processing, and averted the imminent furlough of more than 13,000 USCIS employees. We have also continued to expand our media presence to dispel some of the myths and misinformation around immigrants. We have fielded over 1,500 inquiries from reporters and AILA has been mentioned in the media over 4,700 times this year. Our hashtag hold USCIS accountable customer service campaign reached more than 500,000 people and our YouTube channel gained more than 1,000 new subscribers. The justice campaign's immigration detention advocacy work resulted in about 1,000 letters sent to Congress and was featured in numerous news stories and op-eds from Ms. Magazine to the Seattle Times. And we're ending this ALA year five months into a new president's administration, full of hope and promise, but also not taking anything for granted and continuing to hold the government accountable when it strays from the lofty and laudable ideals of its rhetoric. The Biden administration began with a series of promising executive orders that signaled a long hoped for restoration of a fair, humane, and welcoming immigration system. AILA in turn worked with its volunteer committees to create our vision for America as a welcoming nation, which is a comprehensive plan for executive branch reforms to undo the damage of the Trump administration and revitalize our immigration system to enhance equity and efficiency. We have also published a series of policy briefs on improving USCIS customer service and case adjudication processing times, rehabilitating the immigration court system, ensuring guaranteed legal representation for those in removal proceedings, and phasing out our immigration detention system. These key policy documents enhance and inform our engagement with members of Congress and with our sister organizations as we continue to push for regulatory legislative and executive change. Five months later, much progress has been made. The president has rescinded or allowed to expire multiple harmful executive orders and regulations instituted by the prior administration, including Buy American, Hire American, the Muslim ban, immigrant and non-immigrant visa bans, and the public charge rule. USCIS has reinstated its prior deference policy and returned to using a fairer civics examination as part of the naturalization process. Much has been accomplished, but we as immigration law practitioners know full well that there is still so much more work to do. USCIS, US consular posts around the world, and our US immigration courts here at home remain mired in unfair and inhumane delays in adjudications that are costing our clients their jobs, separating them from their families, and depriving them of the ability to build a life and a future in this country at a time when our country desperately needs all of the energy, promise, and economic stimulus that immigrants have always provided it. In key ways, the administration continues to treat our global health crisis as if it were an immigration crisis, using Title 42 to bar asylum seekers at the southern border, 
and banning the entry of many US visa holders from large portions of the globe, regardless of whether they individually pose a public health risk. We will continue to push for the use of science-based criteria to combat the pandemic, rather than immigration policies that purport to keep us safer, but that just separate families and hamper our economy. And while the administration has proposed promising legislative solutions to improve our legal immigration system, through its continued support for Trump's H-1B and prevailing wage rules, this administration seems to be in disturbing agreement with its predecessor's plans for gutting the H-1B program and making it harder for foreign students at US universities to remain in the country and contribute their skills and talents to our economy after they graduate. We must therefore continue to challenge those policies in federal court, even as we work with the administration to walk back regulations and policies that will undermine our economy and immigration system. So our work continues as we enter our 75th year, much as it has for all of those which preceded it. We will actively support and promote all great ideas we hear from either political party on how to improve our immigration system. And we will resist and oppose any efforts instigated by either party to take us backward. As I look back on this year, I am so proud of the way the AILA community pushed through all that we did to accomplish so much. We have Zoomed, we have masked, we have distanced. We have done what we needed to do to stay safe. And just as importantly, we have lifted one another one another up to stay sane during the emotional, financial, and personal challenges of living through a global pandemic. And I wanna talk about our community for just a moment. When I joined AILA, I knew that I would get great information and the educational resources that I needed to do my job. But AILA is much more than a source of information. It's not just a professional association. It's a community of people who care about each other. People who come together, not as competitors, but as colleagues, as advocates, and as friends. We teach one another and we learn from one another. We openly share our knowledge and support one another in our work without expectation of receiving anything in return other than the satisfaction of knowing that we have helped a colleague in the same way that we ourselves probably once were helped when we needed it. This is who we are. This is what makes AILA, AILA. And it is why I decided to become involved in AILA leadership, to do what I could to preserve and strengthen this community that I love so much and that has given so much to me. Throughout my time in AILA leadership, through my years serving on committees and later on the Board of Governors and certainly for the past six years on the Executive Committee, I have witnessed the power and the energy of our AILA community. As I think back over the years, so many memories flood my mind. A collective rush of euphoria pulsing through a room at the annual conference in 2012 as I sat there with hundreds of other AILA members and watched President Obama announced DACA from the White House Rose Garden. An overwhelming sense of pride as AILA attorneys from all over the country spontaneously converged on airports in 2017 at the start of the Muslim bans. The excitement I have felt multiple times over now when learning that an AILA attorney has just secured a litigation victory that would help their clients and by extension, all of us. The hope the energy and the infectious enthusiasm of AILA colleagues from across the country coming together in Washington year after year after year to tell our clients stories and push for immigration reform during National Day of Action. We have been able to accomplish all of these things because although we are almost 16,000 in number and come from a wide variety of backgrounds and have vastly different ideas, we are still united by a common purpose to promote justice, advocate for fair and reasonable immigration law and policy, advance the quality of immigration law and practice, and enhance our professional development as attorneys. That is our mission. What makes AILA strong is the diversity of its community that brings us differing perspectives and ideas 
on how to accomplish that mission. We don't always agree. And that's a good thing because it's the combination of all voices discussing and working together to reach consensus that gets us to a better result than we would have reached without the constructive criticism and the positive contributions of so many different points of view. Over and over again, I have seen the great things that we can accomplish as an organization when we welcome and respect everyone's perspective and work together to find common ground that gets us to our goal. That's what keeps us strong. That's what keeps us growing, even through all the difficult times that we have faced in recent years. And boy, have we faced some difficult times. Currents of toxicity fanned by the flames of an increasingly caustic and social political environment are coursing through our nation as our own leaders seek to turn us against one another, to divide us in every way imaginable across racial, ethnic, religious, and political lines, and to judge one another based on who we love, how we worship, where we come from. To advance their own ends, our politicians and social influencers encourage us to blame others for our problems instead of working together as one united country to solve them. They actively sow mistrust and suspicion repeating and amplifying conspiracy theories and false narratives to keep us divided and working against each other. In many ways, these are very dark times for our country. And sadly, I have seen these threads of division penetrate ALA as well. This notion that anyone who opposes our way of thinking isn't just a person who has a different perspective or idea on how to accomplish a common goal but rather someone who should be mistrusted and suspected of nefarious motives, should be personally attacked and shut down rather than engaged in a constructive and respectful debate about how to move forward. The forces of division and othering are very hard to resist. They are powerful and they are made all the more powerful for how ubiquitous and normalized they have become, especially during the last four years. But we must resist engaging in fear and anger toward one another. We must do everything necessary to maintain AILA as a safe space where we can come together to express differing points of view and arrive at a better, more well-informed consensus without attacking or dividing. We cannot tolerate bullying or disrespectful discourse in our professional association. We must never assume the worst about one another, but always remember our shared purpose as members of this amazing group of people. Whatever the forces of division and hate blowing around us, AILA must remain a professional, welcoming and inclusive space to come together in an attitude of mutual respect and cooperation. A place where we can disagree without being disagreeable entertain and debate varying approaches to accomplish our mission, arrive at a consensus, and then move forward. If we do that, as we have done in the past, then there is nothing we cannot achieve together. And now before I introduce our new president, I want to offer my thanks to some of those who have supported and sustained me this year. First, I want to say to Ben, uh, when I joined the executive committee in 2015, one of my first tasks uh, as a member of that executive committee was to choose a new executive director. And I think you and I joked with each other at the time that by the time I was president, we'd have both have the hang of it maybe. Um, hiring you was one of the most important and also one of the best decisions that I have made as a member of the executive committee. You have navigated some incredibly difficult waters over the past year, and you have brought us through stronger with the help of the most dedicated and tireless staff that I have ever had the pleasure to work with. I often say that if every ALA member could be as aware as I am of the hard work that the staff does every day for their benefit, they would be in awe. And this year, more than any other, each member of the staff has done the work of more than one human being in order to maintain existing services and deliver new ones at a time when the organization has been understaffed and under-resourced due to the pandemic. So on behalf of the membership, 
thank you to the entire ALA national staff for everything you do every day to help us be better lawyers and to manage our practices. And to my amazing executive committee, Jeff, Kelly, Farshad, Jeremy, Allen, and to our XCOM advisor this year, our immediate past president, Marquetta Lint, each one of you is not only a remarkable attorney and an incredibly hardworking volunteer, you are also each extraordinary human beings whom I'm proud to call my friends. I wanna thank you for being on this journey with me this year and for all that you give to Ayla. I look forward to seeing what you all do in the future. To my family, Jason, you are the love of my life and there is simply no way that I would have made it through this past year without you. I can't wait to see what our future holds when I have only one full-time job. <laughs> to my kids, James, Libby, and Becca, and to my stepdaughter, Celia, I love you and I am so proud of each of you. Thank you for bearing with me during this year when I had so much less time to give you than I wanted and when I couldn't even give you a trip to San Diego in a fancy hotel suite to make up for it. And to my mom who raised me as a single parent while working full time, all that I am and all that I value, I owe to you and your amazing example. And lastly, to all of you, my Ayla family, thank you for inspiring me every day for giving me through your words and your actions, the example I needed to stay strong and keep fighting under the Trump administration and to hold the new administration accountable as we forge ahead into a hopeful new day. If we continue to remain united in our purpose and to support one another as a community, there is no doubt that we can continue to achieve great things for our practices and our clients. And now, as we look forward to the future, I am thrilled to introduce our next speaker. Serving on the executive committee with Alan Orr for the past five years, I have seen firsthand his energy, his creativity and expertise, his ability to engage with ALA members, press, and the public. But most importantly, I have witnessed how he has invested his heart and his soul and so much time into the work that we do as an organization. I believe he will transform Alan during his presidential year and move us forward through inspiration and example. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce your new Alan president, Alan Orr. Thank you, Jennifer. Do you know that 5% of the 1.2 million US lawyers are African-American? African-Americans make up 13% of the population. These percentages have been constant for more than a decade. The knowledge of these numbers makes today extra special. Today we make history together. I would like to take a few minutes to explain how we arrived at this point and to explain what I see as Ayla's next big opportunity. I'm from Valdosta, which is in South Georgia. In my early years, I was raised on a full service farm where tobacco was king. While I was there, I learned the responsibility, I learned responsibility from my grandfather and I fell in love with the land. In my head, I still hear him saying, if you don't have anything to do, dig a hole and fill it in. We worked hard and exhausting days. There are no unskilled jobs. I know that from experience. Having young parents was a part of my upbringing. My father is a landscaper. My mother was a civil servant. My father is Big Al and I'm Little Al. Several of you like me, had a mother who spent their lives making their children's lives better. I had the pleasure of growing up with my extended family on a farm, jokingly called Or Village on Or Road. I lost my mother to cancer in 2017. Her absence today makes me sad for I would have liked to see her enjoy her hard work and support that got me here in front of all of you today. I would do anything to share this moment with her. I am grateful for both my mother and my father. Thank you, NC, Mary, Ari, Shirley Ann, Joseph, Rozelle, Brad, Minnie, and George. You are appreciated. It, wouldn't be, it would be impossible for me to do what I do 
what I do today without the support of my family. Since I was five years old, I knew what I wanted to be, a lawyer. The dream was to grow up and be like Martin Luther King. I loved school and I never missed a single day. My dream almost died in high school when a counselor told me without asking me for my vision of my life that if I aimed high, I could possibly be a grocery store manager. I was a good student, but I struggled with learning differences and language. I tuned out the limitations and focused on the goal of attending Morehouse College. I was accepted and I enrolled in 1991. Morehouse College is a small, all-male historically black college, more commonly referred to as an HBCU in Atlanta, in which Dr. King, Julian Bond, Herman Cain, and the current center, Raphael Warnock, are alumni. There I learned these words from Dr. Mays, the president of Morehouse College, when Dr. King was a student. I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me. Can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I will suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it, just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. In short, don't waste time and have a purpose. My potential was transformed into possibility by Morehouse. As philosophy major, I learned a life's lessons. Always check the source and the intent. You get to define and determine your life. Flowers don't ask for permission to bloom, they just do. Morehouse changed my life and made me a better student, a better person, and truly a better citizen. Morehouse was my first tribe outside of my family. Discovering your tribe is the key to success. My experience at Morehouse led me to decide to pursue a legal education at Howard Law, one of the six historically black law schools. I always thought I'd become an environmental lawyer because I love the land, of the love of the land that I developed from growing up on a farm. However, during my second year of Howard Law, I achieved high marks in a class on immigration law, which led me to a summer job at an EB-5 firm in Virginia. Arlene, the general counsel of the firm, knew about AILA. In fact, it was this connection that led me to my first AILA immigration lawyer, the Dell Swartz. And then Dell introduced me to Pamayani. Pamayani then planted me in the DC chapter for Earl and Rich Souls, and today we bloom. Dell and Palma did more than introduce me to AILA. They opened doors for me. They pulled up chairs. They made people see and listen to me. I had done the work. I had the tools, but I needed the opportunity to use them. Dell actually wrote my recommendation letter that earned me a position with the largest law firm in the world as an immigration attorney. And not to be outdone, Pamiana told me early in my career that I might become the first black president of AILA. This is who AILA has been for me. And my mission is to pay it forward for you. I hope to inspire you to realize your full potential in the community during my time as president. It's important to me that every member feels that they belong. AILA is a place where we are in control of how we view, treat, and support our other members. AILA volunteer leadership is enlisted to nurture and to empower all of our members. It is possible that you will become the president or a chapter leader or a chair of a committee, speak on a panel or lead a workshop or serve as a subject matter expert writer. Like Morehouse and Howard, for me, AILA has the tools, the time and the resources to help you succeed as an immigration lawyer. I will make sure every member knows about the benefits of membership. Afterwards, it will be your responsibility to make the most of your time, your minute with AILA. For me, AILA has always been a group of friends on a path to promote justice, advocacy for fair and reasonable immigration law and policy, advance the quality of immigration and nationality law in practice, and enhance the professional development of its members. 16,000 members are a healthy community. That is why I'm calling on people like Dale and Palma. We are good at providing opportunities for new members. I want us to be great. If you have spoken on a topic 100 times, you have mastered it. Perhaps you could mentor or sponsor someone else. Mentorship means you train someone to continue your legacy. Sponsorship means you just bring the person in the room 
as they are experts on the issue, but like the opportunity to present. Ayla is a tribe. Gail, Amy, Todd, Amy, Brent, James, Diane, Sharon, Kathleen, the Board of Governors, Ayla staff, you are all valued members of the tribe. During these trying times in the world, we need to place greater importance on what unites us than anything that divides us. There are outside forces trying to divide our community and undermine our mission. In this world, some members are devalued due to their profession, their ethnicity, their gender, their race, and or their religion. Many of our clients are subjected to anti-immigration remarks every day. In order to stay faithful to the mission, it is essential that we support each other. Sankafa is an African word for Ghana. Sankafa teaches us that we must go back to our roots to move forward, that we should reach back and gather the best of what our past has to teach us so that we can achieve our full potential as we move forward. Throughout the course of the organization's history, we have learned strength is derived from members and purpose. Our membership has grown from 19 members 75 years ago to, to until what we have today. Thank you all for the strong leaders that came before us to build the community that we enjoy today. By strengthening our strong connections, we will be able to accomplish our goals and meet the challenges of our mission. I see you, we believe in you, and we are here for you. Ayla's next big opportunity is you. As I close, I want to thank Tim for all the support and the joy that he brings to my life. I've been blessed with the most amazing circle of friends, and I want to thank Brad, Brad, Stefan, Scott, James, Keith, Clay, Sean, Tommy, and Bobby for the support and friendship they bring to my life. Happy Pride Month. Happy Immigration Heritage Month. Happy Black Music Month. Happy Caribbean History Month. It is our time to celebrate. Please join us at 10 a.m. for the keynote address from the Secretary of the Homeland Security, Secretary Mayorkas. And thank you very much for this opportunity.